Good morning. Um, can you hear me okay? Just make sure. Yeah. A little bit? Yeah, that's all I was worried about. Um, it is an immense privilege to be back in, in this chapel and talking to you. I, I don't think I've been in a chapel service since 2015 when I graduated, and it's, um, it would be hard to express the sort of emotions I've been feeling worshiping alongside you. Let's talk about this passage. These are extremely familiar words to all of us, of course. I think even outside the church, a lot of people are familiar with the idea that the Bible teaches that Jesus, that God is like a shepherd of, of his sheep and that the people who follow him are a sheep. We find them maybe perhaps intuitively comforting. Um, the early church, even before the cross kind of became a central image for them, this depiction of Jesus as a shepherd was something you could find uh, scrawled on the walls of the catacombs when the church was still being persecuted. As Matthias said, I have two children, six and four. My wife and I are both seminarians. You can imagine we've accumulated just obscene amounts of sort of Christian picture books over the years. Our house is overflowing with them. And I can assure you that the image of the shepherd, God as the shepherd, is also extremely common in those books. It communicates um, on the face of it even, I think, extremely well. And actually in this passage, of course, Jesus uses a variety of imagery to describe himself. He is the door through which people enter the sheepfold. Those who don't go in that way are thieves and robbers. But I want us to focus just really tightly for the next few minutes on this image of Jesus as the good shepherd and why he uses that here in this context. There's three points I want to make this morning. The first is that when Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, he's not simply appealing to sort of pastoral uh, metaphor that everyone could recognize. He's also drawing on a rich theological heritage from the Old Testament. And underlying that, a cultural motif that would have been very resonant and very immediately recognizable to his listeners. Secondly, I won't suggest that if that is true, that if some among his listeners at least heard this theological heritage and this cultural motif, they also would have heard him probably subvert it for what they expected it to mean. And then lastly, I wanna talk about some of the implications of that for us today, and particularly us here at a seminary training to go into ministry. So first, this is not just a metaphor for shepherds in the ancient Near East. Throughout the ancient Near East, the shepherd is the defining metaphor for a king. The earliest literature we have, arguably the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is described as the shepherd king of Uruk the sheepfold. Uh, Hammurabi of Babylon and in his inscriptions calls himself out as a good shepherd of the sheep. Actually, he says that he causes his people to dwell in green pastures, that he provides them with fresh water, all languages, of course, very, very resonant. Um, everything from the Egyptian pharaohs with their shepherd's crook to images in Greece and Rome attest to the fact that for many people, the idea of the role of a king was bound up with this idea of shepherding, of caring for the flock. The Old Testament embraces that imagery. We've already heard this morning the words of David. It's not a mistake that David was himself a literal shepherd before he was called. There's a certain fittedness to the fact that he has defended his flock from lions and from bears, and now he is the shepherd of God's people. But the theological innovation of the Old Testament on this motif is who is the identity, ultimately, of the good shepherd. David doesn't call himself that. He says, as we heard, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. I think there has to be some element there of the theology of Samuel, right? That God alone is king of Israel, and so he is David's king as well. The prophets extend this imagery. They speak most often of bad shepherds. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, they always condemn the bad shepherds of the flock who have exploited the sheep, slaughtered them, used them for their own advantage. And in contrast, they often say things like this. From Ezekiel 34, 15 to 16, God says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. Cause them to lie down in peace. I will seek my lost ones, those who strayed away, and bring them safely home again. I will put splints and bandages upon their broken limbs and heal the sick, and I will destroy the powerful fat shepherds. So just to rehash, in the ancient Greece, the shepherd is the king the Old Testament embraces that, it extends it, and it innovates and applies it to God above all. So now, for our passage. 
this teaching of Jesus comes immediately after he's healed the blind man, and the Pharisees have sort of heaped abuse on both the blind man and on Jesus' authority. Jesus refers to them as blind, and then he launches immediately into this, talking about those who are robbers and thieves who come into the sheepfold the wrong way, those who are hired hands and so therefore do not actually love the sheep and care for them. They are the bad shepherds. In contrast, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And so for his listeners who are standing there and hear this, any among them who are familiar with the scriptures must hear resonances of king language. They must recognize because of this common cultural motif that would have appeared all over that Jesus is not simply making an analogy to shepherding, which they of course would be familiar with in their daily life, many of them, but also to being king, to being the righteous ruler. And perhaps those who are particularly theologically astute might have wondered how Jesus could make such a claim in light of the innovation of the Old Testament with this imagery, suggesting that the bad shepherds will be dealt with by God and that God himself will be the shepherd. And you wonder to some extent how after what seems to us on the face of it, a simple pastoral image, the Pharisees respond by saying he must have a demon or be insane because I think they, they hear these resonances. They have a sense that what Jesus is claiming is something greater than they might at first think. So. Jesus' claim to be the Good Shepherd is audacious and it's bold, but it also subverts what his listeners may have expected when they heard it. So I want to read this section again. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then later, I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. In the church, those of us who've been Christians for a long time, this, this association is, is almost obvious to us. We're really inured to it. We just think, yes, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. But I think that this is actually kind of a wild claim. When I first graduated from university, I worked for a year on a farm, um, which was totally different, the kind of thing you do when you're 22 and you just graduate. But it was on the southern tip of Florida um, where it's still a little bit subtropical. It was actually a research and uh, experiment farm. We, we practice subsistence agricultural techniques that could be applied throughout the tropics. We would train Peace Corps volunteers, missionaries, people would come from the global south to train in these techniques. We did all kinds of stuff, but we also had a lot of animals. We had rabbits, we had ducks, we had a couple little zebu cows that were super cute. Um, and part of my job was taking care of the chickens. Have any, has any of you ever had chickens? Yeah, okay, I see some hands. They're really dumb. Really, really dumb. Um, really dumb. <laughs> I would, these, they would occasionally they would they would try and run away from me if I had come to you know look at their wings or whatever. And they would they would run up to the chain link fence and they would stick their neck through it like this. And then because they couldn't see the fence anymore, they thought they were through it and they'd start running <laughs> against the fence. But you know, really dumb. But I, I cared for these chickens. I, every day I fed them, I watered them, I cleaned out their coop, I made sure they were safe, I pulled them out of the fence, I did whatever they needed. And at one point, one morning, when my year there, I got up and um, the chickens, a lot of them had been slaughtered in the night. There were feathers, blood, really gruesome. We looked around and it became evident that a bobcat, probably out of the Everglades, had come, was getting these chickens. Any that slept near the fence were getting pulled out and, and killed, we set up cages. But I took it upon myself for the next two nights to get up every couple hours, go out to this chicken coop, make sure this bobcat wasn't out there. We eventually caught it in a cage. I never encountered it at night, but afterwards I, I kind of was reflecting on that and I thought, what exactly did I think I was going to do <laughs> if I got out there and I shouted at this thing, it didn't run away. And I have to be honest with you, what I was not going to do was to get mauled for these stupid chickens. <laughs> it, it, it just wasn't in the plans. And as I can tell you that as best we can tell, shepherds in the ancient Near East did not intend to die for their sheep. It was not part of the job description. And I can promise you even stronger, going back to the king image here, kings in the ancient Near East did not see their jobs, by and large, as dying for their people. So Jesus has subverted his listeners' expectations here because he has claimed kingship language to be the righteous king who cares for his people, and he has immediately connected it with this idea that the righteous king lays down his life for his sheep. And then there's a second subversion. At the end of our pericope, he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. 
I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. If his listeners heard him making this claim to be the righteous king of Israel, then certainly their expectation is probably a, a nationalistic one. They have identifiable enemies. It's Rome. It's their oppressors. And yet Jesus ends his shepherd language by saying, I have sheep from other folds, not of Israel, that I have to bring in. I will be one shepherd over one flock. And so already his, his role as a king is to be something that transcends racial boundaries and national boundaries and goes beyond them and draws in many more under his kingship. And of course, those of us here today are the fulfillment of that. Most of us are not probably from Israel. We are not Jewish. We have been grafted in to this flock. And that brings me to my final point, which is the implications this passage has for us. The metaphor of the shepherd as king culminates, really, in Christ. He is the ultimate sort of image of that caring king for his people. But the metaphor, it doesn't end there in the New Testament. It, it's continued to be used, and it's mostly used to describe leaders in the church. They are shepherds, sub-shepherds under Jesus of their flock. And so many of us here are called to emulate Christ as the shepherd. We are not the good shepherd like Christ is. We cannot offer what he offers. We can't lead as he leads, but we are called to emulate and follow him. I think we live, and I think most of us would acknowledge this, in a time where we are very familiar with the cost and frequency of bad shepherding in the church. When I was preparing for this talk, I, I sort of, in my head, ran through illustrations I could use, very public examples of spiritual abuse or moral failure in leadership, several I've been close to personally that I know of. At the end of the day, in addition to not feeling it was appropriate to sort of be specific in that way, it also occurred to me that I imagine most of us in this room already have an illustration in our mind, an experience of failure in leadership in the church that has been extremely damaging and has a more powerful image than I can provide you with. So what are we to do? I don't think most people who become sort of spiritual abusers or moral failed leaders come to seminary intending that to their, be their future. And so Jesus offers some warnings here that we are not hired hands. We are not meant to just care for the sheep when it's convenient for us. And I think that's important. We are supposed to live lives of continual repentance, right? Repentance is something that is often quite lacking in leadership in the, the world, in the West, in the church, certainly. And so we should look to that and embrace it. I also think, though, that he offers something else beyond that. I, I had a friend once who, who gave me a metaphor, and I think it's actually quite common, so you may have heard it. But he said that the Christian life following Christ was not unlike walking across a bridge, across a deep canyon, roaring river at the bottom. And he pointed out that if you're walking across this bridge, and you get part way, and you become terrified and you're not convinced it's safe, and you're sure that you will fall. There is some value in examining your heart, questioning your doubts, wondering about your lack of faith, but there's arguably much more value in looking at the bridge. Is it a good bridge? Is it reliable? Can I trust it? And if it is, you, you walk. And that is Christ for us, our shepherd. So I'm encouraging you to examine the bridge and listen to what Christ says here. He says, I am the good shepherd, I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus' ministry, laying down his life for the sheep, his sacrificial kingship, is rooted in his knowledge and love for them and their knowledge and love of him. And that itself then is rooted in the intimate knowledge and love that is shared between the Father and the Son. Your ministry has to be rooted in knowledge of those you serve and love for them. And even more than that, it has to be rooted in the knowledge and love you share with Christ. In union with the Spirit, we are caught up into that same relationship. That is the source of your ability to be faithful shepherds under the leadership of Christ. In summary, Jesus in this teaching identifies himself as the good shepherd of his people, contrast to the bad shepherds that are exploiting them. 
His statement surely summons to mind for his listeners the idea of kingship, but it subverts that image in key ways. He's a king that lays down his life, that serves, and he is a king who will incorporate people far beyond the imaginations of the Israelite at the time. For those of us called to follow in the footsteps of the Good Shepherd, to be pastors, shepherd in Latin, to care for some portion of the flock, Jesus offers both a warning and a promise. Do you want to be good shepherds, whoever God places in your lives? Then look always to your own good shepherd, the righteous king who has called you into his flock, who knows you and who loves you, just as he knows his father and his father loves him. You were called into this relationship of intimate love and knowledge. Look to Jesus as your shepherd. Know him and know his voice. Follow him and follow where he leads. Let me pray. Father, um, you are our shepherd. Every blessing we have is given by you as individuals, as a church, as your body. We know that we can trust you because you love us and care for us, and I ask that we would know your voice when we hear it and we would follow it. Protect us from the sinful desires and ambitions of our hearts that lead us to be in danger always of slowly drifting into abuse and greed. Don't let us be like hired hands. Form us into shepherds like Christ that we may follow you and serve your people well. Amen.